I cannot even express in words how grateful I am to Lakeland because um, I have, I feel like I had an old life and it was a really long 40 years worth of life, but now I have this life that I never even imagined because I'm so, I'm free of burdens and my husband is free of his burdens and it's like we can put everything up to God and we know that we don't have to carry everything on our own anymore. It's changed my life and my kids' lives. It's the best gift I've ever received. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Yeah, we got another beautiful November Sunday. God is good this fall. It's been awesome. Uh, glad you're here. We got a packed house. This is super exciting. My name is Eric Swanson. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Lakeland, so I get to work with and oversee ministry from 7th through 12th grade. Our main thing meets on Wednesday nights, and we have a blast. If you know a junior high or high schooler that's not coming, push them, drag them, kick them out of the house, whatever it takes to get them here. We've got a bunch of people that they'll love to get to know, and we'll have a good time, and they'll get to know Jesus as well. So that's who I am. My wife and my kids and I moved on up here uh, just in the last few months. We've only been at this church for like Two, two and a half, almost three months, and it's been exciting to be here. Um, a lot of you guys know I've known Pastor Josh for many, many years, and so through him I've known Lakeland for all these years, and I've kind of heard the stories and seen what God's doing. It's a church that I've been really proud of. It's a church that I've spent time praying for, um, and now God's called me to be on up here with this church, and it's really humbling, but it's really exciting to be here. So, uh, and I know if I asked you guys, uh, some of you guys weren't here six months ago or two years ago, and so God is doing a lot of work. I mean, look how full this room is, and we've also got the Belfry venue right now with a room full of people uh, who've gone over there to make that their, their site for worship. We're one church in two locations, and they're filling up that space as well. So God's doing a great work. And that's what we're talking about with Multiply in this Multiply Remix series. But uh, just to help you get to know me a little bit, uh, I made up this phrase when I was a kid, maybe in high school, and um, I've said it a whole bunch of times. My wife has heard me say this. She kind of rolls her eyes. But I've always said, life is a lot more fun with a little adventure, right? Anybody with me? Anybody else feel that way? Life's a lot more fun when it's just a little bit more exciting with a little adventure. So I find myself actually manufacturing adventures for myself to try to keep life engaging and exciting. And so uh, I, I make up stupid games for myself. I play the gas tank game. I don't know if you guys play the gas tank game, but <laughs> some of you guys know this game, right? Like the manufacturer tells you how many gallons fit in the tank. And my goal is to be so empty by the time I stop that I can get even more gas into that tank. So like if your gas, if your car says it can hold 12 gallons and like the light comes on, you're freaking out and you pull over to the next gas station and you only take nine gallons, that's weak, you know? You failed, you lose. You could have driven for days without having to stop, okay? But if you get to 11 plus gallons, 11 and a half gallons, you're like, whoo, I didn't have a whole lot of gas, but once in a while you win the game when you pump 12.1, 12.2 gallons of fuel into that 12 gallon tank and you're like, take that General Motors, that ain't a 12 gallon tank. Right? That's the gas, but because of this game and because I like to live on the edge, I've literally ran out of gas in every car I've ever owned. I'm not joking. I can remember my dad bringing me gas. I can remember walking to get my own gas. I remember my wife picking me up and we went to get gas. I remember my uncle bringing me gas. I remember my grandpa. And I remember exactly where these places were on the highway, on the back roads. I remember one time this like farmer guy found me pushing my car. I was in a suit and my fanciest shoes. I was on my way to my sister-in-law's wedding. It was July, I was by myself, and I was in the wedding, so I couldn't be late. So I'm literally pushing my car, trying to steer it out of the way, and a farmer picked me up because God is good, and he's like, I only live a mile from here. I jumped in his truck, we got some gas, I made it to the wedding on time, I was early, no one knew until after the wedding, and Cherry's like, I can't believe you didn't get gas, right? One time I ran out of gas, uh, we were on an event for our church where we were uh, leading a trip. And uh, like the whole weekend, my wife's like, you got to get gas. This thing has been like down for a couple days. And I was like, relax, we got lots of gas. We'll get gas after this weekend. So of course, Saturday morning in the middle of the trip, we're on our way to meet the leaders. They're waiting for us, and I run out of gas. So I'm like calling them up. I'm like, um, I'm about a mile away, but I'm out of gas. So somebody picked me up. We left the car there, and we got it later. But I just want adventure in my life, right? Because life was way more fun with a little bit of adventure. And, uh, but you know what else is also true? The Christian walk, doing life with God, is way more exciting with a little bit of adventure. 
In fact, if you take risks for God, not like, I'm not saying invent stupid risks, but if you have faith and you follow God even when it's hard or even when it's scary, life is a lot, it gets a lot more exciting and it's a lot more meaningful. That's how God calls us to follow. And that's what we're talking about in this series. So a year ago, we launched this two-year initiative called Multiply, which is, oh, let me put the challenge on the screen. It's for every one of us with purpose to multiply and reproduce ourselves as disciples. That it's not just um, as a church we want to see more people come to know Jesus. We do, but we want every single purpose, every single person to decide to do that, that we would just be blowing the doors off this place. And as you can see, we've done that. So in this last year, we've added the Belfry venue, and uh, we're trying to grow our serving team so we can be prepared to serve the more people that come. We're trying to start new small groups so we can prepare to plug people into groups as they form. And and just be as prepared as we can because God is doing a great work and we believe he's not done. So this is a two-year thing that we started last year. This is the halfway point that we're doing um, this Multiply remix. So here's kind of my words. Multiply is an invitation and a challenge for each one of us to adventure with God. That we would say yes to whatever God calls us to. That we would go on adventure because life is a lot more fun. Following God is a lot more sweeter when we adventure. So it's a, it's a challenge to us to engage deeper and invest even more in what God's calling us to do. So this morning, um, I want to look at a passage. If you've got a Bible, and there was one under your chair if you didn't bring one. But uh, I want to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus takes his, at the time he's got to 12 disciples, and he calls them on an adventure. And this is like a full of faith required, risk-taking adventure with Jesus. That's a little scary and a little hard for them, but he says, this is worth it. This is what I want for you. This is how I want to use you. And so he sends them out on an adventure. So Matthew chapter 9, it's the very first book in your New Testament. And we're going to be way at the end of this chapter. So in verse 35... Here's what happens. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Now, I just want to pause because this is an incredible verse. This is like 10 chapters worth of Bible in one verse, okay? Students will ask me sometimes, how many miracles did Jesus do, you know? And I'd be like, well, I don't know because there's verses like this where Matthew got tired or lazy or something and he didn't write them all down, okay? And John says the same thing at the end of his book. He's like, if I wrote them all down, there wouldn't be enough pages to contain it. So you can start thinking, well, he did the water and the wine thing and, and he fed all those people that one time. You can kind of count them out, but he did a lot more than we know about from what was written down by these guys. But look at this verse. He went through all the towns and villages, teaching their synagogues and preaching the good news and healing every disease and sickness. And I just think that's really cool. So again, I don't know if Matthew's just like, you know, he's writing. When I read a book, you know, your kids might do this too. When you get towards the end of a chapter, you start like, how many pages do I got left before I finish this chapter? Maybe that's how Matthew was writing this chapter. And he's like, oh, there's a lot of things that I remember. So he's like, and then Jesus went to all the towns, right? And then he healed everyone, right? And this is how I prayed when I was a kid because, like, I, I wanted to get it over with. So I'd be like, Jesus, please help everyone everywhere. Amen, okay? Anybody else ever pray like that? And then you see your friend, like, I prayed for you last night, and they think you're super, super Christian guy, right? But Jesus is doing incredible work. Person by person, one by one, town by town, he's knocking it out of the park, and he's blessing people, and he's changing their lives. But look what happens in verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. And I love that that verse that says Jesus sees the crowds and he has compassion on them because he is in the middle of doing amazing work, one by one, healing diseases, calling out demons, preaching the good news, on to the next town, on to the next town, on to the next person. But he turns, and as much as he's doing that's making a big difference, he sees crowds of people. And he's like, how am I going to get to all these people by myself? And he says, guys, he's got 12 disciples. He says, look at the crowds. They're ready to receive me. They're ready to have their lives changed. They're thirsty. They're hungry. They're lost without me. We need more people in the game, more people engaged deeper in investing more and reaching them. And that's what we want to be about as a church. But I love that it says he has compassion. So this is a really interesting thought. Somebody challenged me with this one time. It really kind of helped me. I think you can see people without Jesus in two categories. When you, see, when you know someone or, or see a group of people that don't know Jesus, do you see them as lost or do you see them as wrong? 
Jesus sees them as lost. He says they're helpless. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They're, they're deceived. They're harassed. And he has compassion. If we see people as wrong, you know, sometimes as Christians, we see people who don't yet know Jesus, and we're like, you're so wrong. How could you think that? How could you believe that? How could you do that or say that or act that way? And we see them as wrong, but when we see people as wrong, we judge them and we push them away. But if we see people as lost, we have compassion on them. Jesus sees the crowd and he says, I, I want so badly to help more people. So he's like, guys, we need more people in the game. All right, let's keep reading. And this goes right into chapter 10. And here's the thing, when Matthew wrote this, it wasn't like he broke it down into chapters. People did that later so that we could kind of navigate it in our own Bibles. So he just continues his story. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. He calls his 12 guys over, and he says, listen, I'm doing amazing work over here, but we need more people doing it. I'm going to give all 12 of you guys the authority to go and do what I'm doing. And he sends them on an adventure, and I'm sure when he does, they're a little, like, honored, and they're a little scared. They're a little excited, and they're a little nervous all at once. But what he's doing is he's getting more people in the game. He said, we need more people in the game, so boom, you guys are it. I'm going to send you guys out. See, even 2,000 years ago, Jesus was all about multiply. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was already all about multiply. Pastor Josh didn't make this up last year. This is how Jesus always operated. He's calling his people to make more of his people. He's calling his disciples to make more disciples. See, Jesus was good at math. He knew that one plus one did not add up as fast as 12 times one. And that's what we want to be as a church, is that every single one of us would be reproducing ourselves as disciples, taking God's love to the people that we know, bringing the people that need Jesus to church and watching God change their lives. Okay, go to verse 3. So verse 2, or go to verse 5, I'm sorry. The next couple of verses just lists all their names. Um, verse 5. The 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. You might have heard that phrase before. That's kind of a, a popular phrase. Even if you don't go to church, we've kind of heard the idea of freely you've received, so freely give. And, um, and Jesus gives them amazing amazing skills and talents and gifts. And he says, I'm going to have you casting out demons. I'm going to have you healing people. I'm going to use you to do amazing things. And when we hear this phrase, freely we receive, freely give, I, I think for a long time I thought, it's just talking about our salvation, right? Jesus forgives me for my sins, and I didn't deserve it, and I can't earn it, and it's a free gift of God, so I should, give, I should share that with other people. And that's true. But when you read it inside of this passage, Jesus is giving them authority, and he's giving them his spirit, and he's giving them power, and he's saying, I'm going to work through you. He's like, but you didn't deserve that either, and you couldn't have earned that either, and I've just blessed you, and I've gifted you in amazing ways for free, so give it away for free. Use everything that you've got. Use everything I've given you to bless other people. This is how we're going to change the world. Freely you've received, so freely you should give. It's an incredible challenge to all of us to recognize how has God gifted me? How has God given me power and authority? How has God equipped me to help others? It's something that I can't just hold on to because God has poured it into my life so that I can use it. I want to look at one more passage with you guys. So flip farther into your Bibles into the book of Acts. Just a couple books farther. This is another passage that may be something you've heard before. So in, in Matthew chapter 9 and 10, we see Jesus sending his 12 disciples out kind of for the first time and giving them this power to go and make disciples on, with, you know, in his name. And then in the book of Acts, Jesus has died, he's risen again, and he's ascended into heaven, and he's given his spirit to every person who believes. And then he says, go and make more disciples. And this is, what, this is how the apostles did it at the very beginning of the church. So as we read this passage, I want you to think of what we call the big three. That multiplies about multiplying in our worship, in our groups, and in our serving. Because we really feel like the big three are best for people, for every single individual. That if, we're, if you're someone who's invested in worshiping God as a, as a group, and invested in serving others through how God's wired you, and part of a group where you can encourage each other, and be cared for, and go deeper with God and each other, that we think that's best for individuals. We also think that's how we'll make the biggest impact in our community. So listen to those big three as we read this passage. Acts chapter 2. In starting in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as, the, as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And check out this last sentence. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily. The church was blowing up. Peter and all the apostles were just trying to do their best to share Jesus with as many people as they could. And they were worshiping in the churches and they were getting together in people's homes and they were caring for each other and serving one another and giving to each other. And God was just using them in amazing ways. They were growing closer to God and more people were added to their number. That's what we want to see continue to happen at Lakeland. That's what Multiply is about. That as many people as we can get to engage deeper and invest more in what God's doing, especially through those big three, he's going to use that to change our lives and to change the lives of people around us. So let me just walk through these big three really quickly, okay? And I'm going to do small groups first. Small groups is, is what we want to be about as a church. And, and uh, the staff here has even explained to me, we've had small groups for a long time, but in the last couple years, we've really tried to make a mental shift of not just being uh, a ministry that we have, but really being the identity of who we are as a church. And we want to get as many people involved in a small group. Some of you guys are in a small group right now. Some of you guys used to be or never have been. And I'm going to challenge you to think about what you could do to invest in small groups, okay? This is where we go deeper with each other and we go deeper with God, but it's really where we care for each other. The idea that uh, there's been people in my life that when I'm down, They've encouraged me. They've picked me up. And then the very same people, sometimes they're down, and I, God has used me to encourage them. We need each other, right? And that's why I want to be invested in groups. I was even thinking about this in, in, a, in a funny way. I'm a huge Cub fan, and they just won the World Series. I don't know if you heard about that, but there was, a, there was this, this epic rain delay, right? So game seven of the World Series, and it goes to extra innings. And the Cubs thought they had this great thing going, and then they didn't, they didn't make it, and it goes to extra innings. And the time... They go into this rain delay, and the Cubs were kind of like, oh, the Indians have all the momentum. Oh, this is bad. We've used our pitchers and all this kind of stuff. And so they go in, and a lot of the players tell the same story. They said there was a guy or two that stood up when we were down, and they, they encouraged us, and they challenged us, and they picked us up. And I almost picture like they limped into the rain delay, and they ran back out. And here's the thing. If those guys had only been on the team for like two weeks, I don't think their words would have held much weight. I think those people would have been like, ah, you're just saying that because that's what you're supposed to say. But these guys were close. These guys knew each other. These guys trusted each other. And so when one or two of them stood up and said, guys, pick yourself up. Be encouraged. Let's go do it. We can do this. The rest of them followed. And this is what we want to see small groups do, that it's a place where we really care for one another because it's great to be here on the weekends and to worship God together, but we want to be in groups where we can intentionally care for and relate to each other and be real with each other and be authentic and go deeper with God and each other. So here's some ideas for next steps for you guys. Maybe join a small group, give it a try. Maybe lead a small group. You know, if this church is going to multiply, then we're going to need more groups and we're going to need more people to lead those groups. Maybe God's calling you to think about that. Maybe even launch a brand new group because if we're going to add people and we want to get them plugged into groups, we're going to need new and more groups. So when I started my very first Sunday here, this guy named Pete came up to me. He's like, hey, are you in a small group? I was like, I, I, I've been working here for like six minutes. This is my first Sunday, you know? <laughs> and uh, he's like, well, I'm starting, my wife and I are starting a brand new group. Do you want to be in it? And I was like, brand new? That's cool because I won't be the only person that doesn't know everybody else. And so my wife and I decided to try it out. And uh, so the very first week, they start kind of telling us their heart for small groups. And they said, we've been in a small group for years, and it's some of our best friends, and we love it. But we realized we want other people to have the same experience. We've got to start more groups. So we prayed about it. We felt like God was calling us to leave our group, even though it was awesome, and to start something new so we could create more of that goodness for more people. And I was like, well, I'm glad you did, you know? And, uh, but then they said this, and we really feel like this is what God wants us to continue doing. So we want to form this group, and in the next year or so, or two years, we want to hand off the leadership of this group to somebody else, and we're going to, we see ourselves as people that should keep planting new small groups, which is really cool. But my wife said, so you're breaking up with us on the very first date. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I guess we kind of are, but I love that their heart was, we want to help more people get involved. We want to help more people get plugged in. So I don't know what the next step looks like for you. And then serving is the other another one of the big three. But this is where we invest who we are and what God's given us. Just like we see in, in Matthew chapter 10, God gives them power and authority and blesses them and says, now go as freely as I've given to you, you should give to everyone else. And that's what we want to see more and more people investing who they are. 
you have been made in a unique way by God to reach other people. You've been made in a unique way by God to serve. And so we want to get more and more people serving. And here's the thing. If the church continues to grow like it is, we need more volunteers. Right now, there's a whole bunch of volunteers making coffee, parking cars, uh, serving in all the different children environments. And like, we really do need people in the game. But way more than that, the reason I want to challenge you, if you're not yet serving, to think about it and give it a try, is because I know how good it is for you to step up an adventure with God. God will change your heart in ways that um, you won't experience if you don't follow him like that. And he's done that in my life. That God has gotten a hold of my heart when I've stepped up and followed him and serving. It started for me back in high school. I'd gone to church for a long time, but my youth pastor said, hey, I want you to be on this leadership team. And what we'll do is we'll talk, you know, there's a group of students that are going to decide youth group is not just about me coming to church. It's about me helping other people experience God when they come to church. And I was like, wow. So we would meet separately and do Bible studies. And then when we showed up, we had certain things we had that we were in charge of and responsible for. And at first, I was a little nervous. I remember the first time I had to pray in front of a group of people. I was all nervous, and I was like, oh, I'm going to mess this up. But I remember, like, beforehand, people were praying for me that I would, like, pray well, you know? And I was like, oh, this is cool. But God showed up, and he's continued to show up every time I've stepped up and followed him. And he's used me to reach people, and I'm like, God, it's not because of me. It's only because of you, and I want you to experience the same thing, so I want you to get involved in serving. So maybe a next step for you, we do a thing called Serve Track. We're in less than an hour doing a Sunday service. You can meet with a team that will help you talk about where you could fit in and how God's wired you, and that would be a cool thing for you to start. Um, or on your connection card, you can just check, I'm interested in serving, and somebody will start that conversation with you. But at Lakeland, we like to invite people to investigate and then jump in. So how that looks for student ministries on Wednesday nights, when someone's like, hey, I'm interested in serving, we'll talk to them about it, make sure they understand what they're getting themselves into. And then I always say, come just check, a, check out a Wednesday night. Feel free to just watch it, and then you can like love it or hate it, no pressure, because we don't want people to feel like they volunteered and then like, oh, now you're stuck for life. So I'll say, if this is a great place for you to serve, awesome. If not, I'd love to help you plug in somewhere else. So we need as many people as possible serving in as many ways as possible, and we know it's really good for you. The last of the big three is worship, is we want to multiply in our worship, and God is doing an awesome thing here, and we want to be prepared we, we need more seats this morning, and there's another service yet to come. We want to be prepared for more people to show up. And it kind of reminds me of my parents were always throwing parties when I was a kid, always having people over, always hosting. And, like, it was a lot of work. For days, we would have to clean and prepare before, and then for days, we'd have to clean and prepare after, okay? Because all of our friends and family were, like, messy, I guess. I don't know. But, like, it was a lot of work, right? And it was a lot of money. They'd buy all this extra food, and they'd go out of their way to throw these awesome parties, Especially in the holidays, it felt like we'd just clean up after one and we'd be getting ready for the next. But they realize it takes intentionality and inv investment if you're going to, you know, have more people over. Couples do this when they decide to start having kids. They start thinking, do we need more bedrooms in our apartment? Do we need to save more money before we add to the family? But God is adding to this family, and we want to be prepared. So we're already starting plans on uh, how can we build, not just so that we have more seats and a service, but we have more room for all the people's kids and reach them as well. And, and how do we do this? And we're already saving money and making our plans so that we can be responsible with what God is doing. So here's the next step for you. Be an inviter, be an investor that you would just be an inviter, that you would just be introducing people to Jesus. Take the church to people, but then bring people to church. We're going to try our hardest to make sure we always have room for them. But then also be an investor. Maybe God is calling you to, to give towards multiply in a way that he can use what you've got. We can serve, we can be involved relationally, and we can be involved in investing in our worship. That's what the big three is all about. But if you think back to um, that challenge that Jesus gave his disciples, the original time that he sent them on an adventure, he says, freely you've received, freely give. I've blessed you. I've gifted you. I've just given to you so that you can go and use it for other people. This is the same challenge that God gives us. He's blessed us. He's called us. He's saved us. He's gifted us so that we can be used. And here's the thing. Um, as I think about that, I kind of picture my, my kids. I got four kids, but one's, one's kind of a straggler. The oldest three, we had three kids in like a year and a half. So they're like triplets, right? They're all the same age. They went through the same phases. And what I would love to do is if I was going to give them like a treat or a candy or a snack, I like to give like all three to one kid and be like, you got to go share that with your brothers and sisters or with your two brothers or however, whatever. And uh, you know in that moment they're tempted to just like, well, if they don't know that I've got three candies, that's three candies for me. They don't need to know, right? And they just want to keep it because, you know, I'll put one under my pillow and have it tomorrow, whatever. But I'm so proud. Most of the time my kids are really good at sharing. And they realize that if they don't, they're cheating me because I didn't give them three for themselves. And they're cheating their brother and sister 
because they wouldn't get candy, right? In fact, my one son, if I give him two pieces of candy, he won't even eat one until he gives one to his brother. Like, he'll, he'll have it for a few minutes if it takes him to find him in the yard because he just feels like, God, you know, Dad gave me this so that I can give it away. And that's the same picture of God blessing us and gifting us as he calls us out, as he's given us this amazing salvation and these amazing gifts and these amazing abilities to be used for him. And he says, don't hold on to it. It's yours to give away. So here's how I would say it. You owe it to God to freely give. You owe it to God to multiply. That's what he wants for you. That's what he's called you to. He didn't give you all that candy just to eat it on yourself, but you also owe it to others because that's God's plan to reach more people. His plan was his church to go and make disciples, his disciples to be bought into the idea of making more disciples. And you owe it to the people that you know and the people that God gives you contact with to help them to freely give and to multiply. But then the last thing I want to make you think about is you owe it to yourself to multiply. You owe it to yourself to freely give because as you take risks and you step up in faith and you adventure with God, he will, he will do awesome things through you, and you will love it. And I want that so bad for every single person that comes to our church. So whether you're brand new to God or church, we want to invite you to think about how you can engage and invest in what God has given you and how he's called you to lead, or whether you've been here for a long, long time. That's the challenge. That's what Multiply is all about. We want to be a group of people who are just excited and passionate about making more disciples. We're going to do that through the big three, but we're going to freely give because we've been so blessed. I want to invite up Pastor Josh. He's going to walk us through a little card and close us out. All right. Hey, give it up for Pastor Eric. Thanks, man. Appreciate you taking us into the Word. So this is kind of our halfway point for um, our Multiply initiative. It's a generosity initiative. And as soon as I say that, a lot of you are like, generosity initiative, they're all just about money. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. And um, quite frankly, we're just, we're not. And let me just tell you, I, I want to be honest with you for, a mo for just a second here. Um, I want to tell you kind of my love-hate relationship with uh, generosity initiative commitment cards. <laughs> we get to these places where we, we want people, we want to challenge people to make commitments. And I've been through three or four generosity initiatives at a variety of churches. Obviously, Lakeland is one, but also some that I was a part of before. And... Um, Here's what I know, is if I make no goals, I hit it every time. And if I make goals with Jesus, and I experience God fulfilling that goal, my mind is blown every time. So every time I, I, I'm on a kind of a journey, or my wife and I are on a journey in terms of a generosity initiative, and we come to a place of saying, all right, God, what are you leading us to to do in terms of being generous with our time, our talent, our treasure. Whenever he leads us to something specific and we take that bold step and we actually fulfill it, we go and we do it and by his strength, guess what? Every time our mind is completely blown. And I'm not going to lie, I want that for myself again. I do. But I also want it for you. But here's my love-hate relationship in the commitment cards. I hate people assuming that we're about money because we're really not. I could care less. What I do care about and what I do love is seeing people hear the voice of God and respond to it. And so what we did is we approached this commitment card, which my son already made mine into a paper airplane. So because life's always a little bit more fun with a little adventure, right? Um, we tried to reflect <laughs> in a way the love-hate relationship. <laughs> that we're not so concerned about dollars. We're more concerned about you responding to what God's leading you to do in your life. Um, and so in this commitment card, there are commitment cards, and I'm not going to ask you to fill this out right now. I'm going to ask you to actually take this and just take it home. Because as we started this thing last week, I said, um, I'm not going to ask you to make any financial pledges or anything like that. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to have a conversation with God. And that's what this card represents as a conversation with God. And so I'm asking if you would take this home and have a conversation with God. And next week when we're going to come together and we're going to turn in commitment cards, it's really a reflection of have you had a conversation with God? And would you share that with us? Because our goal here is that we want to see people, people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and commit their lives to the mission of Jesus. This card reflects being changed by Jesus and committing your life to the mission of Jesus. That I've met with him and I feel like he's changing me to do something differently differently. 
and I'm, I'm making a personal commitment. I know what it is. You don't need to know what it is. And I don't need to know what it is. But if it's, if it's specific and it's, it's a goal that between you and God, then you can say, hey, I've, I feel like the Lord's led me to something very specific in terms of how he wants me to be generous with my treasure and invest my resources. And uh, a way for me to commit and be generous with my time and invest in relationships, maybe in a small group, or committed to be generous with my talent and invest serving with my gifts. If he speaks to you in any one of those areas in a new way, some of you might have already, God spoke to you maybe a year ago, and you're like, I'm still in this journey, and you can just check those boxes. But if there's something new for you, and you're like, this is exciting and I'm going to commit to it, we'd just love to know it because we want to celebrate that with you. That's all. It's like a daddy being proud of their kids <laughs> when, they, when they do something where they're like, they, they, they listened and they obeyed. And quite frankly, the greatest joy in my life as well as my wife's life and our staff is when we see you guys here, hear the voice of God, respond and obey. And we just love to delight and, and uh cheerlead you guys, kind of get behind you and, uh, and celebrate that with you. So that's what this represents. So this week, would you take the, com uh, the commitment card, would you take it home, just start praying this through this week and say, God, how would you like me to be generous with my time, talent, and treasure? That's all. Next week, we're going to turn these things in together, and it'll be a celebration, um, really, of how God's been calling us into a life of greater adventure together. Amen? All right, let's stand together. We'll close here in prayer. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for the great adventure of following you. As we follow you and we get changed by you and we commit our lives to the mission that you are calling us to, it will blow our minds. It's scary at times, but it's great. Freely as we've received, we're to freely give. And you've blessed us in so many ways. Lord, help us not to hoard our time, our talent, and our treasures for ourselves, but to utilize these things for your kingdom purposes, to invest in other people, to love other people, to point other people to you. I pray that you would use this, this group, this body of believers to multiply, not just because it's a cute idea, but because it's a wonderful adventure you're calling us each to. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Mm -hmm.